Um, so I added some notes uh, link in the Discord so you can kind of follow along. Um, there's still kind of a work in progress because there's just, there's been a few issues that have been troubleshooting this morning. So the plan is um, to talk about authentication this morning or and this afternoon. Um, we'll be working through using that to build up a login screen, right? And how to hook that in and then how to use that with the app as a whole. Um, so far, what I did previously, I just kind of hard coded a username. I just said, hey, my, my username is PR Smith, and we'll figure out this problem later. So now we want to sort that problem out, okay? Um, so a few things we need to go over is how to implement that login screen. Uh, we're going to have that appear when the when the app starts. That's going to be the first screen that the user sees, um, which means that our our previous main activity, we're going to have to do a few changes there just to make sure that it doesn't start at main activity, it starts at login activity. So we're going to have to re-swizzle a few things there. Um, once we get that, once we get those kind of things moved around, uh, we're going to use a tool or a neat set of APIs they call Firebase U UI um, that's going to help with um, the authentication process. So it's going to provide a lot of the auth layouts and workflows in terms of actually getting the user to log in, register account, link account, etc. Um, so that's going to deal with a lot of the, the kind of the account management stuff. Um, but that we're going to use in the first screen. Once the user is logged in, um, we'll then be using the the, in, the um, auth APIs to see, okay, well, who's logged in? Give me their profile information, such as their user ID, email address, the profile icon, and use that to kind of start populating a few things um, within the UI, okay? Um, also in there, um, we want to look at how to implement auto login. So namely, if the user is coming back to our app, we don't want to have them to log in again every time they open the app, and that's kind of the default behavior. So we want to implement a little bit of logic, which is kind of going to send them past that login activity if they're already logged in. Um, the next part of that is how do we sign out? So we're gonna look at how do we do the signing out process. Um, typically we wanna do that in a way that the user is specifically initiating it rather than say pressing back or up and accidentally navigating back to the login screen. We usually wanna avoid them accidentally logging themselves out. So we gotta talk about how to do that and how to do a manual logout process. Um, the place in the UI where I'm going to put that sign out button is actually up in the menu bar. So that's another thing we need to talk about briefly is how do we how do we put icons and things and options in the menu bar, which we've talked about kind of, I did show you an override with the on option item selected. We kind of talked about up navigation versus back navigation, but we haven't really talked about how do we put our own options up there as well. So. That's another item for discussion today, okay? So that's a kind of quick overview of that. We'll be talking about mostly off, but we'll also be talking about the menu bar a little bit along the way. Um, I will say, as I was testing this this morning and kind of writing up these notes, I did run into some issues. I was able to troubleshoot some of them, but not all of them. So we'll maybe troubleshooting a few things as we go along here, um, just because things did not work out um, quite as document says. Uh, so, so we do have to walk through and, and troubleshoot some of those issues. Um, there's a really good intro, if I can play it for you, um, that will kind of go over what the Firebase authentication system is. Um, let me go ahead and pop this in. I think if I hit play here, I think I'm already wired. Yep. Okay. So this is their own little... Firebase makes authentication easy for end users and developers. Most applications need to know the identity of a user so they can provide a customized experience and keep their data secure. Firebase supports lots of different ways for your users to authenticate. If your users want to authenticate with their email address, you can build that for them. Firebase Auth has built-in functionality for third-party providers such as Facebook, Twitter, GitHub and Google. It can also integrate with your existing account system if you have one. You're given the choice about how to present login to the user. You can build your own interface 
Or you can take advantage of our open source UI, which is fully customizable and incorporates years of Google's experience in building simple sign-in UX. No matter which one you use, once a user authenticates, three things happen. Information about the user is returned to the device via callbacks. This allows you to personalize your app's user experience for that specific user. The user information contains a unique ID which is guaranteed to be distinct across all providers, never changing for a specific authenticated user. This unique ID is used to identify your user and what parts of your backend system they're authorized to access. Firebase will also manage your user's session so that users will remain logged in after the browser or application restarts. And of course, it works on Android, iOS, and the web. That's Firebase Auth, allowing you to focus on your users and not the sign-in infrastructure to support them. So that's their quick, quick overview of, of what we're talking about. Um, part of the important part of this is it, it works together really well with Firestore. Um, namely in the sense that we haven't talked about how to secure that database yet, but this is what's a, a step in the way to be able to do that. Um, in order to limit who can do what in the database, you have to have first users um, authenticating through this system. Um, otherwise, anybody can do anything in your database or read any data. So that will allow us to limit that a bit. So in general, you know, their kind of intro to this um, is that most apps need to know your, the identity of the user, and in knowing that identity allows you to do a whole host of things, both from a security standpoint, saving their session, passing that data between different devices. So if they've got five different devices, or you've got a web app, or you've got a mobile app, and maybe an iOS app and an Android app, it, it opens the door for them to do communication between those different devices. Um, so um, there's backend services here. One of the things you might remember me saying kind of at the outset is that, that Firebase is kind of a backend as a service. Um, it's more than just, say, a database. Mongo's just a database. Um, it's providing a whole backend. So that's why, you know, this authentication system is built into and, and integrated with it. Um, you might think of this if you're building, say, with Node, it's almost like you're already getting uh, Mongo plus some additional real-time features plus Auth0, which is a common provider that, that people kind of go to to provide some of this federated login stuff. But we, we get it together built in with, with Firebase. Um, so underneath the service, um, when we do these federated logins, when we log in with other services, say, um, through uh, Google or Facebook or Twitter or GitHub, um, underneath the surface it is using OAuth. And remember we kind of looked at OAuth a little bit when we were doing the eBay integration. It doesn't have integration with, I don't believe it has integration with eBay itself as their OAuth implementation, uh, but it is using that underneath the surface, even though you don't normally see the, the nitty gritty of those OAuth tokens and such. Okay, so let's walk through what we need to do to set it up, okay? So the place you want to start is to go to the console first. Um, before we get into the code, um, there are a few things we need to set up on the console side. Um, so I'm going to go over there. Um, you'll want to pick your project. Um, under the build section, um, remember that we spent most of our time so far under Firestore database land, right? Um, so today we need to go into the authentication section. Um, mine looks a little bit different because I've already pressed a button. If you're first time here, you'll see some tutorials and, and a few different buttons. All you need to do is click on Get Started. I was hoping I could get it to return back to here and back to the, the first appearance, but I couldn't get it to return to how it looked after I'd click it to get started, it would always show me this. So once you hit get started, more than likely it's going to ask you about sign-in methods. I actually turn mine off. So I need to delete providers. Yes. And go here, delete providers to get me back to where you're at. So more than likely, if you look under uh, once you have hit get started, 
um, you're going to probably see something like this, um, where it says set up the sign up method, or if you're under sign in method, uh, you're going to see something like this. Has everybody got that? Okay. Um, so again, Firestore provides a bunch of different ways to sign in. Um, the two ways that we're going to go about is setting up the email and password login, as well as the Google login. Um, now, because I had some issues setting up the Google login when I was testing this this morning, um, let's try for the moment not setting up the Google login. Um, and maybe that will help us get past it. Um, if, if Once we get back to here, we can come back and turn, it, turn that on once we've done some of the other things. So I'm going to go in and turn on email authentication. All I need to do is click on it, hit enable, and then I'm going to hit save. Um, there's another option here for email link. I'm not going to check that. Um, that's a different um, login method entirely. Okay, so you should see something like this now. Okay, um, so that's step one. Step one is to go turn on the providers that you want. And again, usually that's going to be your email and Google or whatever else you're going to provide as well. Okay, um, it's worth mentioning when we're looking at these ad providers, um, a lot of these providers you do have to go through other websites to go and set a set of the, um, finish the setup process. So for instance, um, if you want to set a Facebook login, you can't do it all here. Um, you would have to initiate the process over on Facebook, create an app, and get all the auth keys. And then once you have all that information, then you can go back here and, and fill it out. Um, some of those have, a have an approval process, which can be anywhere from a week to a month long. So just a heads up there, if you're wanting to do any other providers, you may want to initiate that process soon. Um, I'm only asking for Google and email, partly because that, that sign up process is easy. Google can entirely handle that internally because, because of that. Um, but some of those are harder. Uh, GitHub's pretty easy because their approval process is entirely automated and, and very fast. Facebook says slower because there is an aut there is a manual. Somebody has to go review your request and say, yes, this is good. Um, so that's where some of those may have a longer turnaround. All right, um, next thing on my note. Um, this is not strictly required, I think, if you're doing email authentication. Um, but it is required for all other kinds of authentication. Um, so I do want to kind of walk through this process with you, um, especially since it's an easy place to get stuck. Um, the instructions are kind of hard to find, and they have some issues. So uh, we're going to walk through that. So in order to support Google authentication and other kinds of authentication, um, you need what's called a SHA-1 fingerprint. It's a hash, OK? Um, so you're taking what's called a, a, a certificate, right, which kind of proves your identity, proves you are the actual developer of this app, um, and using that to using that to kind of sign the operations, whether it's you know authenticating with the server, building, etc. Um, so this is this is kind of an important part from the security perspective. Um, another thing to be careful about this. Um, is the certificates. Um, when you install Android Studio, um, it will automatically generate a certificate that's specific to your computer. So all of us have different what we call debug certificates. Um, they're all part of you know, the Android Studio installation process. Um, so for instance, if you have maybe a home computer that you're working with, that home computer is going to have a different debug certificate. If your Windows machine were to be wiped, you have a problem, you lose the hard drive, you're going to lose that debug certificate, you would need to redo this process. Does that make sense? So for anybody, if you're, if you're doing coding at home and it's not on your laptop that you have here, you will need to repeat this process with that computer as well. Okay. Um, also means that I need to have both my debug cert in there as well as your debug cert. So you're going to have more than one fingerprint when we finish this process. Cool? And that way I can, I can log in and, and test your application as well. So um, the tool that they recommend using is something called the key tool, uh, which is a utility that's provided by, as part of Java, as part of the Java JDK. Um, so that's, that's the tool that they recommend to get these certs with. Okay. 
Um, this is no, by, by far not the only way. I think I have seen other ways to get this, um, but this is a tool we're kind of playing around with here. Um, one thing to mention, this key tool is command line only. There is no GUI for it. Um, it is, so we do have to worry, work a little bit with the terminal to make this happen. Um, one of the things that means is that we're going to run into some issues with, say, the path, and we're going to have to work through that a little bit. It also means that the command on, on Mac is a little bit different than the command on Windows. Slightly so. So there will be some issues that we may have to trouble, troubleshoot with in terms of getting this working on Mac. Okay. So when I talk about terminal, uh, that's kind of a loaded different term especially depending on what operating system you're in. So for instance, on um, my computer right now, I actually have three different terminals, okay? Um, one of those terminals, I can right click and go to Git Bash. This is a tool that you all should have in installed that came with Git. Um, effectively, it's a, a Bash shell, which is sort of like how things work on Linux. Linux usually uses a Bash shell. Um, that's one terminal that you can use. Um, there is another terminal that you can use called PowerShell um, in Windows. You can also run commands through here, or you can go to CMD, open command prompt, and run commands through here. The reason I mention this is because all three of these, all three of these shells have a different syntax. All three of these shells have a different syntax. And you may get a different behavior depending on which shell you use. You may get a different behavior depending on which shell you use. So that's a big heads up, OK? I don't know what the right answer is yet, um, because I ran into some issues with, with setting this up. So um, the one that I tried before this was the command prompt. So I'm going to try and run through it that way, OK? now. Everybody with me there about the different shells? OK, so how do you get into this, this terminal? You're going to go to the start. You're going to type in CMD, and you're going to click on Command Prompt. OK. Um, Michael, do you have your terminal open? OK, good, because obviously yours is going to be a different way. Um, so let me zoom in a little bit. Um, here. I'm going to just start by typing in key tool, OK? Just typing in key tool, OK? Now, notice that it immediately came back with key tool is not recognized as an internal or external command, operable program, or batch file. It doesn't actually know how to find key tool, OK? Um, the instructions online don't actually say anything about that. They just presume that it is. I think part of that is that because it used to be at some point that the JDK, when we installed Java, it set this up. But the current versions of the JDK, and, and honestly for the past several years, that hasn't been the case. Okay, um, So it can't find what it's looking for, which is namely keytool.exe on Windows, or maybe I don't know what the extension is on Mac, but it's looking for that. Um, did you get the same output, Michael? No, or? I typed in key tool and I got like a bunch of Awesome. So that's good. So you're going to have the easy mode because it's not you're not going to have to do this setup. Um, so on, on the bash shell, like yes. if you type a key it pops up. Yeah. It like did? Terminal, I'm not on Mac, bash. So. Okay. Yeah. Um, which that's, that's kind of weird to me that it would work on the bash and work different. Because for me, I get this on bash. I guess I'll try. Get bash here. Yeah, so I'm going to go through CMD because I'm, I'm going to guess that more than likely that's the what too. they, what? I got the same too. Okay, yeah. so I'm not entirely sure why more than likely what that means for you is that you may already have your path set up, Brandon. Um, and in what that would mean for you, Michael, is that means that your path is also already set up. Um, that means that when the installer went through, the installer did set up the path. 
Um, and that may mean, like in Brandon's your case, maybe we work together and we set that up at the beginning of class and I forgot about it. Um, or you may have set it up for some other reason. So um, there's two ways to resolve that problem in general. If you see this in a terminal, um, and this is really applies for both the Windows and Mac, there's two ways you can solve it. Either you specify the full path to the exe, or you can say, hey, let's update the path, the path variable, which is system-wide, and that tells it what directories does it look for by default for executables, okay? So I'm gonna do that, that latter approach. I'm gonna do the approach of updating the path of variable to tell it where to go, okay? Where to find key tool.exe. Um, this is probably gonna be a different computer. This, this may be a different path on your computer. It may not be the same path as me. Just a big, big, big heads up, big qualification. Um, because depending on what version of the JDK you installed and what operating system you're on, it will be located in a different place. Is everybody with me there? Okay. So let's walk through how I'm going to find that. Because again, yours is like, yours may or may not be in the same place as mine. Okay. Um, it's a good long path, so I want to make sure we find it. So I'm going to go to the file explorer. Okay, we're going to start at the C drive. I want to go to details. Okay, under the C drive, it's going to be one of two places. Program files, x86, or program files. If you installed the 32-bit version of it, it will be under program files x86. If you installed the 64-bit version of it, it will be under program files. Is everybody with me with that first part? Hopefully you've installed the 64-bit version, so it's going to be under program files. But if you get in there and you don't see it, then I would look over under program files x86. Cool? All right, so assuming the 64-bit version's there, we're going to go into program files. I'm going to look for Java. So I'm now under C program files Java, okay? You're going to see a set of JDKs and JREs here. Does everybody see that? So if you're under program files Java, okay. Um, those folder names are going to be different based on what version of Java you have installed, okay. So looking at my screen, what version of Java do I have installed? 17. 17.0.1. The whole name does matter because we do need the full folder path to this, okay. So you might have 17.0.1 installed, you might not have 17.0.1 installed. Use whatever version you have installed. But you do need to make sure that it's the JDK and not the JRE. The reason for that is the JRE does not include the key tool, but the JDK does. Is everybody with me there? The JDK does. Okay. So take the JDK folder that you have. Okay. This is basically where we installed Java. Okay. Now, I'm now in JDK 1701. Do you see any executables? There's no executables here, right? This folder, remember we previously, beginning in class, we had actually set this up as our Java home, okay? This, we've already got an environment variable setting, this is Java home. Uh, but the binaries are not here, okay? Binaries are, and this is a kind of a tip, typically we put binaries or executables in a folder called bin. It's a normal standard convention. So if you're looking for binaries, you're looking for executables, look in the bin folder. Okay. So if I look in the bin folder, you're going to see there's a bunch of things. Um, namely, there's two kinds of files. There's a bunch of DLLs and there's a bunch of EXEs, right? So what I'm looking for is keytool.exe. If I scroll down far enough, you're going to see there, right there, keytool.exe. So by a show of hands, has everybody found keytool.exe? Cody, you're still looking for it? Brandon, did you find it? Yeah. Okay. All right. So this is the folder that we're looking for. Okay. Now, good note, I want the folder, not the path to the executable. Okay. So what I can do now is I can click up here. And I can copy the path from there. Right, so that's the path that we need. 
is down to the bin folder. Everybody good with me? Okay, so I need to update the path variable. So I'm gonna type in the dot, I'm gonna type in env, short for environment variables. Um, you should have this edit, edit system environment variables. That's where we wanna go into. Um, on this dialog, we're gonna click environment variables down at the bottom. This dialog is kind of known as the advanced system properties window. There's a few different ways to get to it. Um, all right, and when we click in here, we're gonna see environment variables. This should look familiar because we've been here before, okay? Uh, remember that there's a top section and a bottom section, right? The top section you can see is specific to my user. The bottom section is specific to the computer, mm -hmm. okay, it's computer wide. Um, typically speaking, again, that bottom section, if you're changing system and machine variables, that usually requires a system restart. Um, but the user variables typically apply just with restarting the program. Um, so just one hands up, you know, you may need to restart whatever program that depended on this, on this path. So that means things like, I might have to restart Android Studio, I might have to restart the terminal um, to make all these things work, okay? So up under the top section, um, it's also worth noting that uses the, this one as an override for the other. So under here, you'll see I have a variable named path. Does everybody see that? Okay. Um, be very careful with this path, okay? If you mess it up, your computer might not boot. Or you might have problems getting into a variety of system utilities within Windows. Be very, very careful with editing this, editing this file, editing this variable. Everybody good with that? Okay, so what does that mean? We're gonna click in here to go edit. There's a bunch of stuff already in here. Don't change any of that. Don't change any part of that. Um, because specifically, there's a few things in here. Um, namely, these are all for, for various tools that we've installed. Um, or have used, most of them programming related. Um, but you might notice, for instance, there should be one in here for Windows. Um, you'll see one, there's one for the, the MySQL shell, etc. in there. Um, I'm not seeing actually the one for Windows. I think that's over on the other side. Um, but I have done this previously, so you might notice that I already have like C programs, Java, JDK 15, slash bin, right? That's probably from last semester when I ran this course, right? Um, but obviously, I have a different, I have a different um, JDK installed now, so it can't find it anymore. Um, typical good pattern, you will probably not have that. So typically, we're going to add new things to the bottom of this list. So I'm going to click New. It's going to go down here, and that's where I'm going to paste it here. Um, so for you, that's, that's likely going to be all you need to do, is if you have something that can't be found by the system, you just need to go in here, add it to the path, and you're just going to add it to the end. Okay. Um, it, it's worth noting that it will search. Windows will go through anytime you ask it to run an executable over the terminal or through other programs. It will look through this list and check these folders turn by turn. Okay. Um, so the order of them does does matter from a securities perspective as well as for for other other reasons. Um, but I'm just going to add that to the end um, because I have the extra one in here. I'm going to remove that. You shouldn't need to do this because you shouldn't have that record in there. Um, so I'm going to remove my old one. There we go. Okay. So we've added that in. So we got that. All good? Okay. So that's where you can find that setting. Um, if you're on Mac, I do believe we had to set up, uh, when we may have messed around with that, Michael, I think at the beginning of the semester, I think we had to set it through the terminal. And there are ways on Windows you can set that through the terminal as well. Um, I usually find it a lot more convenient to do it through the UI though. Okay. Now, if I go back to my terminal and I type in key tool again, it's still going to give me the same response because the environment variables haven't like really been updated. Uh, basically, the thing to understand on, on Windows and most operating systems, when you run that program, when you start that program, is when it gets a copy 
of all the environment variables at that time. From there on out, you can't get new environment variables. They're locked in when you start the program. Okay, so the only way for it to get to the new environment variables is to restart it, is to restart that program. So I need to shut that process down and start it again. CMD. And so if I type in key tool now, now it's going to give me this set of options. I think this is where you were to begin with, Michael, right? Um, and do you have this as well, still, Brandon? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so this is, this, is, this is what we want to see. This means that it can find the uh, binary, and it's giving us the help window to say, hey, you can run these commands. Okay. Um, now we can try to run the command I actually want to run. Um, I'm going to go grab it from not here. Um, I'm going to go grab it from this. I'll copy it in there. Okay. So this is the command we need to run. Be very careful that it does need to be all on a single line. This needs to be one, one single line. If you spread it over multiple lines, it's not going to work. You may get unintended effects. And you might not see them until later. Okay. So effectively, we're telling it to go give me my debug key. So you can see that's after the alias. It's saying, which key do you want? I want my debug key. And we're pointing it to where our debug key store is. So namely, you can see that's in percent user profile slash Android slash debug dot key store. Okay. You can look at that and you're going to find that file. Okay. So go ahead and run that command. I'm going to check in with where everybody's at. Um, the default password to that is Android. So try to run it again. And it's weird. It's like I it's like it automatically runs it and never gives me a chance to type in the password. Probably because you have an additional enter in the command. Probably, yeah. Probably because you have enter where it's just the like enter after. Well, I won't do that. Yeah. Just right click. There it goes. Okay, yeah, right. Yeah, and then type in I Android. Yeah, type in Android and enter. Android? Okay. Okay, so you got a fingerprint, which is good. Yeah. So instead of user profile, it means you fill the slash. So fill um, and it's till the slash. Tilda is basically the more home director. No. Um, slash. So it's your home directory of Android. And then you can go to sort one. Okay, it does not exist. Um, try to run it with sudo at the beginning. So go up. And at the beginning of that, add sudo in this case. So you can force it to. Yep, that's going to run it as a super user. You can change the run. Oh, sorry, that would be your, um, your admin password. Still says it does not exist in the file path as well. Um, you might need to try forward slashes and say about slashes. Um, yeah, just say Amber.
temperature, and check the band or this all the way through the system. Yep, check that band or That's okay. It's sticking there, but I'm just hiding that. There it goes. So keep that up. You're going to have a, a, a fingerprint in there. The other fingerprint. You didn't have a fingerprint? Good. Okay. Yeah, okay. Good. Okay. Okay. Everybody's on the board. I'm going to run that on my computer as well to make sure I get that fingerprint. Tool list the alias Andrew debug key. Doesn't like that last half of the Yeah. What did you do? I put quotes around the second part. Key store was tampered with, her password was incorrect. There we go. Okay. So, what you're going to see in this output, there's quite a few things going on, right? Um, but the part that we care about is this line right here where it says SHA1. Does everybody see that line in the middle? So, I'm going to highlight it like so. I'm just going to left click and drag to select that, okay? Um, and then what I need to do is right click it and right clicking it will copy it into the keyboard, in the key, into the clipboard. So select it with the left click and then right click on it to copy it to your keyboard, okay? So what I need to do is go back into the console with this number now um, and I'm going to go into the project overview. Okay, yeah, I have to go to the project overview. And you need to go find your application here. So, like, it's it's movie list Android. Um, that's kind of where we want to be. Uh, oh, no, I need to go to project settings here. So, go up to project settings and scroll down. So, you can see I've got my application here. Right. So because I only have an Android app, I only have one entry here. Um, if I had a, like an iOS app and a web app, then those would appear here as well. Okay. Um, let me go ahead and delete the SHA-1 that I had added previously. So underneath the application, you're going to see this option. You're going to see SHA certificate fingerprints. This is where we put those fingerprints. Um, so I'm going to say add fingerprint. And I'm going to paste in that fingerprint that we got from the console. Paste that fingerprint. Now, um, I need you to add yours, and I also need you to add mine. Um, so I'm going to put in that on the Discord so you have a copy of it. Uh, okay. Yep. You're, you're showing your I'm showing this example on the movie list. Can we use these fingerprints for all of our apps for both the music? Yes. And for yeah, yeah. It'll be the same. It'll be the same SHA one both for the movie list and for the game list. It's specific to your computer, not specific to the project. Okay. Okay. It's specific to your computer, not specific to your project. Um, that's because we're looking at the debug key store. Um, 
if we were trying to do this more for production, what we might do is we might have a key store that we use for the entire team, and we would call that maybe a release um, key store, and then we'd be basing it off of, off of that. You might even have a key store that's different per project then. Okay, but for the moment, you know, we're just going off your debug key store. Okay, so you're going to add your number in, and you're also going to add my number in from Discord. So what I want to see on there is you should have two numbers. Two numbers. So you need to add my fingerprint as well. So go here. So it's worth mentioning that this, this kind of tool, that SHA-1, effectively it's verifying, um, the, the, it's verifying the developer, it's not verifying the end user, if that makes sense. It's verifying that only the people that are allowed to build and distribute this app are the people that are building and distributing an app. So it's meant to prevent from other people just like, hey, I want to write an Android app and use your database. Right? You have to have your SHA-1 in here for the authentication system to work with the app. Does that make sense? So it's not it's not a guard, it's not proving um, your your end users, it's proving your your developer accounts that they have access to the code. Okay. So obviously you want to keep that thing extra secret. Alright, so uh, that's that. We've got our SHA ones in. We've added them in the console. Um, the next thing we need to do is because um, we've done some things with the SHA-1 and we've done some things with the setup, we're going to need to download a new Google services.json file. Okay. Um, so if I go back in, it should be here, right? So you see where you just added the SHA-1s there's an option to download Google services.json. We, we had downloaded and pulled this down previously, but this is a new one. So I'm going to click on this download. It's going to download it to my downloads folder. Okay, And we kind of need to do the same process that we did um, to set this up. So as a refresher, um, I need to open the project in Android Studio. So I'm going to open up my movie list project or whatever project you're working with today. Uh, I really don't have a problem if you're today, like if you want to just code along and do this with um, your game library, I have absolutely no problem if you want to do it on this project instead of the movie list project. Uh, because it's really just a matter of here's the kind of setup stuff that you do and you kind of do it once and then forget about it. So um, I'm going to pull up the movie list because that's where I'm working. So you want to look at the project pane, which is what I have on the left. Um, and under there, under the project pane, remember we have these different views that we can look at, right? So by default, when you open up a project, it usually puts you into Android view. Yes? Yeah, I can turn one of the lights down. It looks like it's out of focus, Mr. Sage. Cool. Yeah. It looks like it's a little out of focus. I'm not sure how that happened. Oh, doesn't um, it? Doesn't I can I can adjust that. You're right. It is a little bit of out of focus. <laughs> and this text is kind of small. <laughs> so let's see if we can adjust that. Close as I can 
right there. Uh, yeah, right there is really good. Yeah. Some things will get bumped. We'll just have to readjust that. Okay. So, um, I need to go to the project view so I can actually see this file. Just remember the project view is how is it actually appearing on the file system. Okay. So, under there, you're going to be looking down and go into the app folder. And under app, you should already have a Google service.json. Does everybody see that? Okay. So, you should already have one there. Uh, I'm going to grab the one from downloads. And I'm going to drop it over on top of that one and replace it. If it'll go. Oh, I need to drag it to app. There. Um, so when I drag it to app, it's going to ask this refactor and says, Do you want to overwrite this file? And I'm going to say yes. Okay. Um, it should be almost the same, except for one change. I can look at look under commit to see that. So the difference should be, it should look like this. Under client, OAuth client, you should have one additional JSON object. Does everybody have that now? That's what's different. That's the only difference that you should see. Uh, is there's a difference in now we've specified some, some information for OAuth. We need to put that part in. Okay. Everybody got this? Show of hands. Everybody at the same place? Okay. All right. So that's the, the first part to set up and, and get working. Um, we may have to come back to that um, and, and troubleshoot trying to get the SHA-1. I think that was part of my issue is maybe I got the wrong SHA-1 to begin with. Not entirely sure. Um, but if you get issues with signing in, you might go back and check that process. Okay. Um, it's worth mentioning that notice here that we have an update to the Google service.json, but notice it doesn't have any reference to the SHA-1. It doesn't have any reference to the SHA-1. The reason it changed is because we're now we're potentially enabling OAuth stuff, authorization. Uh, but it, it's not, if we need to go back in and change the SHA-1, we don't have to change this. Okay? So that's kind of a, a one and done thing. Okay. Um, I want to make sure I go back to the Android view so that I'm not stuck here, so that I'm not like, well, what happens kind of in the next step? So make sure you go back to the Android view. So to just refresh, we've set up SHA-1, we've turned login providers on, on, this, on the console, um, we also need to now go into the dependencies and add some new dependencies. So we're going to look at build.gradle. Um, you're going to make sure that you go into build.gradle, the module version, not the project version. And again, this is back down at the bottom. Um, if you're still in the project view, this is obviously going to look different and the files will be different places. So this is a good reason to get back into Android. Um, down at the bottom, of build Gradle, remember we previously added some dependencies, right? Um, so we've added things like Picasso, at one point we added Retrofit, and we've also added some dependencies in for uh, Firebase, right? So you should already have some. Uh, namely the three I have here, right now I have these three lines in there. Does everybody see that? Okay. Um, important thing to note with my initial state that I have here, notice the first one that I have is Firebase Bomb, that's build materials. Um, what that one is doing is saying for the ones after it, what versions to use. Um, so it's important that that one has to come first. That one has to be first in your list of Firebase dependencies, is that build of materials. After that, then we tell it what parts of Firebase we want. So previously I said, hey, I want Firestore and I want Auth, which I do still want those. I just need some additional pieces that I didn't ask for at that time. Um, so it turns out that I need three things. Okay, um, I need Firebase Auth, 
I also need something called the, I need the Firestore, uh, the Firebase UI package as well. And I'm also going to need a package to support my Google login. Okay, So we're going to end up with the bill of materials plus four dependencies. Um, now, finding these in the docs is a little bit hard because they don't put them all in one place. Um, in fact, I had to look at three or four different pages to get all of the dependencies that we need. Okay, The good news is I put them all in my doc documentation here. So if you look here on step six, that's what we need. Is we need Firestore, we need Firebase off, we need Firebase UI off, and we also need Com Google VM group. Uh, you might notice that of those, some of them have version numbers and some of them don't. Okay, so some of those are in the bill of materials, and other parts of that are not in the bill of materials. So when I put those in, that's going to look like this. Um, I've intentionally spaced things out to add some blank lines before and after to make it clearer to say, hey, here's the, the Firebase stuff, right? I might even want to put a comment on that to just say, hey, these are the um, Firebase dependencies. Okay. So Firebase Auth is the core authentication ABI. Anything you do with Auth, you need that. The next one, Firebase UI Auth, is what's going to provide us the nice user interface pieces that we want to play around with and use, where they give us a, a login and, and such. Um, and this last one here, Com, Google, Android, GMS, that's specifically if you want to integrate or log in with Google Play, or, or sorry, Google with your Google account. If you're not logging with your Google account, you don't need that last dependency, but that's part of where we're going. I want you to be able to log in with Google, so we do need that dependency. Um, if you are logging in with, say, Facebook, you would have another dependency here for Facebook. If you're logging in with Twitter, you'd have a dependency for Twitter, etc. So um, for every login provider that you have, you're going to have a different dependency. Does that make sense? So. Uh, there are a lot of dependencies to pick from. Look at the documentation for the particular depend for the particular um, uh, login provider that you want to use. Okay, um, so it's worth noting there: Firebase, Firestore, and Firebase Auth. Those don't have version numbers because they're coming from the bill of material. The last two do because they're not part of the bill of materials. Cool. All right. Let's sync it. So I'm going to hit sync now. Okay. Um, let's take a quick break to just stretch our legs at this point and then we'll talk about the next the next piece of setting up the login activity. Um, this is the part that's this is the part that's a little bit usually the, the part where people have the most mistakes um, and where it's sometimes hard to track the documentation. <laughs> 